Uh, they're watching us from over there, so they'll know. It's probably not on now, but uh, it's on in a moment. All right, thank you everyone for uh, returning promptly. Uh, I am going to uh, begin now with the pension uh, panel, and it's my great uh, privilege to welcome Jonathan Chevro, who will be moderating our pension panel today. I would also add that this is the first year we have included a standalone pensions panel, as I think this is an increasingly critical issue and one that needs to be explored in greater detail. The evidence is all around us, and that evidence is clear. Canada needs to have a serious look at the pensions and retirement savings challenges that we face. Now, Jonathan has been a fixture of Canadian financial journalism for more than 20 years. He was recently appointed editor of Money Sense magazine, Canada's top personal finance magazine, following a 19-year career as a financial columnist at the Financial Post, including 16 years as their senior personal finance columnist. He is the author of six mutual fund guides and a book on the stock market and a co-author of the wealthy boomer, Life After Mutual Funds. That project led to a magazine, a discussion forum, the wealthy boomer blog, and the wealthy boomer web videos. He is also the author of a financial novel called Findependence Day. Following the panel, you will get up uh, sorry, that's, those are my notes. So, Jonathan, please uh, join us here at the podium. Thank you, Greg, and uh, thank you for all showing up here. That was a very interesting um, session that Michael Lee Chin gave us, and I think it's pretty well directly rele relevant to uh, what we'll be talking about, particularly the, uh, the PRPPs and uh, the role of financial advisors, etc., um, in, the, in the course, in the, the thoughts of equity, we're going to go alphabetically here. So immediately to my, uh, my right here is Susan Eng, who will be speaking first. And she, of course, is the Vice President for Advocacy at CARP, the national nonpartisan, not-for-profit organization committed to advocating for social change that will bring financial security, equitable access to health care, and freedom from discrimination for all Canadians as we age and as we grow wealthier. Now, under Susan's leadership, CARP has helped to shape the public discourse on key issues such as pension reform, investor protection, mandatory retirement workplace age discrimination, home care, and age-friendly cities. Increasingly, CARP has become a trusted source of public policy input at all levels of government and the media. And in, 2010, in 2012, Susan was named one of the Hill Times Top 100 Lobbyists. So welcome, Susan. I, I guess we'll introduce the other two uh, just in front of their presentation. So we're going to have uh, maybe four or five minutes per person. Susan? Thank you very much, uh, John. And thank you, everyone, for having me here. Um, as a representative of your customers, um, I feel a little bit like I'm the beggar at the banquet, but um, uh, I, I think the perspective is important, and I'm, I'm glad to be here to try to represent it. Uh, we have, in focusing on health care, a proposal called One Patient, which, as you can obviously anticipate, speaks to the issue of all the different parts of the health care system that you have to try to access when a loved one is in need of any kind of care. And we might have a new proposal that says one investor, because of course I'm talking to different regulatory arms of the industry, uh, different people who have different responsibilities and so on. And at the bottom of, of that pyramid, in the upturned pyramid, is the individual investor who simply is trying to save enough for their own retirement. And that has become much more difficult for Canadians today because so uh, a much smaller proportion have workplace pensions where those uh, serious financial changes and decisions are made by professionals rather than by themselves individually. Uh, rather, people now are uh, having to make do with their own decisions in RSPs or not saving at all or not investing at all because they're afraid. And we have a growing concern for the number of Canadians now reaching retirement age with no savings 
or certainly inadequate savings. And of course, we in a period of time when investment returns were very poor and that their parents were able to retire when interest rates were about 15, 20 percent. And so they didn't have to make any investment decisions. They just didn't have to, you know, they just had to put it in GICs. Um, now the climate is completely different. In addition to all of that, people are losing their jobs in mid-age and not getting new ones and now concerning themselves with how they're going to start catching up on the non-saving that they've carried on all along and they will start to make rash decisions and so I was very pleased to hear earlier in the earlier session of all the efforts that the different regulatory arms are trying to, to take uh, to, to protect uh, their clients against the wrong kind of decisions for them at this point in their lives. Now that all being said, therefore, uh, one of CARP's uh, proposals has been that there is a need for a supplementary uh, pension savings vehicle. And we've uh, been pushing that for the last several years and the federal government has come forward with a proposal, the pooled registered pension plans, which are a step in that direction of providing some kind of uh, large size pooled savings vehicle that makes it more likely that people will save and more likely that people will, will earn more on their savings. However, as it's currently constructed, we believe from our perspective that it's inadequate to the job. It may not be any more attractive than current RRSPs, of which there uh, is only a 5% take up in the available RSP room. And the question is, what should government now do about the proposal that they have on the table and what should we do as advocates to improve the situation for all those Canadians, some estimated 8 million Canadians without a workplace pension and no hope of getting one. So from the perspective, uh, from our perspective, we're looking for a, a national savings vehicle or a regional savings vehicle that has a critical mass to actually make the kind of uh, sizable decisions and wise decisions that, as Michael Lee Chin has finished uh, telling us, that the CPPIB and OMERS and teachers have been able to make. And what is it that distinguishes those funds from what we can do individually and indeed what the PRPPs are going to do? So we're looking at that and obviously our members are very concerned about this. We have about 300,000 members across the country, all potential clients, um, especially of the type of clients that you would like to have. They are all by and large 50 or more, um, although we are trying to uh, encourage younger members, but uh, they will be your target group. And this is the group of people who either or have already retired or are likely to retire soon and have saved or not saved enough for their own retirement. So this is your target group and what should we tell them? What should we ask them about what the government has done? We have asked them about the savings vehicles and their reaction has been give me another CPP. Right? And of course, small business will push back because they can't afford the employer contributions. And we said, well, if you're not going to get the CPP, what, you, what would you like instead? Um, and we asked them about the PRPP. They don't like it for a number of reasons, not least of which that it is a defined contribution arrangement, that they fear that the fees will cut into their earnings. They have some skepticism about the private sector, I don't mind telling you. But I think that in our last survey, the one thing that we asked them about that they thought uh, that that would be the most interesting for them was employer contributions. Now that makes a lot of sense, obviously, if you leave for your own investments with that of the employer. So that may be the reason why our members wanted the CPP enhancement rather than another voluntary uh, uh, proposal. So that lays out the groundwork and I hope the landscape of, of where we're coming from as an organization and I would say representative of a lot of older Canadians. Remember as, as one of the earlier speakers said earlier that uh, the number of seniors is increasing, will double in about 10 or 15 years. In fact, if you look at the 45 plus generation, you're looking at nearly 40% uh, of the population. Seniors represent about 15% of the population and uh, 45 plus. Uh, it was 42% before the last census. I think it's a closer to 45% now of the Canadian population. So it's a large group that's interested very keenly on this issue. So uh, I hope that the changes that we talk about will, uh, will take place 
and I think it will resonate with a very large part of the population. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Um, next, alphabetically, is Malcolm Hamilton in the center here. Malcolm is probably well known to you all. He's a partner with Mercers. He's specializing in the design and funding of employee benefit plans in both the private and public sectors. Clients include the Colleges of, Art, of Art, Applied Arts and Technology and the Ontario Teachers Pension Plan that was referenced by uh, Michael Lee Chin earlier. Malcolm graduated from Queen's University in 1972 as the gold medalist in mathematics. He attended McGill as a National Research Council scholar, received his MSc in 1975 and became a fellow of the Canadian Institute of Actuaries and a fellow of the Society of Actuaries in 1977. And I might add, he's certainly one of the, uh, the go-to uh, actuaries and retirement specialists for we in the, in the media. I might also say that uh, he, he, right now there's a series of audio podcasts I've done with Malcolm. You can find them at the uh, moneysense.ca website. And also Dan Richards, who uh, has, does the Client Insights, I'm sure he's well familiar with you all, also has a series of video interviews with Malcolm. That's two that I know of. Perhaps there's others. So uh, over to you, Malcolm. Thanks, John. Uh, retirement systems right now are struggling right around the world. Uh, you can't find a developed country in the world that thinks the retirement system is well functioning. And the, the reason for that is you, you cannot insulate retirement systems from the economy. And for the last 10 years, we've been uh, in an economy that has been uh, very hostile as far as retirement savings plans are concerned. We're looking at declining and now very, very low interest rates. Uh, stock markets haven't done terribly well for 10 to 12 years now. Uh, we've got aging populations, which is putting an awful lot of pressure on government budgets. And uh, we're beginning to see uh, basically government reneging on Social Security commitments by pushing retirement ages up seemingly without regard to how much warning people need to be given or whether people are even going to be able to work to the new retirement ages. Uh, this has nothing to do with the design of the systems. Uh, all types of plans in all different countries for all income levels uh, will struggle uh, when the economy does badly. If you can't get a decent rate of return on investment, uh, then no matter what kind of tax shelter you have, no matter how your plan is designed or invested or administered or regulated, uh, the system will struggle. So one of the things we have to be careful for is that we don't uh, take what is fundamentally an economic crisis and an economic problem and misdiagnose it as a retirement system crisis. Uh, our retirement system has problems, uh, but if we just go off at random changing things, when the fundamental underlying problem is the economic problem, it's not going to make any difference. You know, if we fix the economic problem, our retirement system will function better. If we don't, almost no matter what we do, uh, it's going to continue to struggle. Uh, the one thing we have in Canada, on the economic side, we're frankly, compared to most places in the world, doing quite well. You know, it's not that we don't have problems. It's that any time you become depressed about the problems with the Canadian system, look at the U.S. or look at the U.K. or look at Europe, you know, pick anywhere else, Take a good look at their problems, and I, I don't think you'd trade places with them. Uh, the one self-inflicted problem we have in Canada is uh, an incredible complexity to what should be a much simpler system. Uh, we have right now, for Ontario seniors, 10 different programs that are supposed to help them provide for themselves in retirement. Uh, we have four that provide government pensions. We have three different retirement savings plans, and we have three different tax credits that are targeted at seniors. And most people go and study these uh, by looking at them program by program. And the problem with doing that is you have this horrible mismatch of uh, programs with no apparent purpose, uh, lots of details. And at the end of the day, even if you understand the programs, you don't understand what it means. Uh, and as a consequence, I think in Canada, we don't really understand uh, what our system is or how it works. The way to understand the Canadian system is try to organize it by income level. And uh, I will do that very briefly right now. Uh, if you take, for instance, the working poor in Canada. So let's take someone who works full-time for minimum wage, which is about 20000 a year. 
And let's say they work 35 or 40 years and retire at 65. Uh, here's the story for them. The, you know, the basically, during their working lives, they take home, after taxes and CPP and EI, about 17500 a year. That's what they live on their whole life. Uh, when they retire at 65, having saved nothing, uh, they will take home 18100 a year from government programs. It'll come from CPP, OAS, Guaranteed Income Supplement, and refundable tax credits in Ontario. They have replaced 104% of their net income without saving anything. Uh, so the lament that the problem we have in Canada is large numbers of Canadians aren't saving for retirement, that, that isn't a failure of the Canadian system. That's how the Canadian system is supposed to work. We are supposed to have large numbers of working poor people who don't save for retirement. <clears throat> Frankly, uh, with housing prices at these levels, we're supposed to have large numbers of young, over-indebted Canadians who don't save for retirement because their first priority has to be to get their debt under control. Uh, <clears throat> let's move a little up farther up the scale. Let's double that up to 40,000 a year. So now we've got someone working full time for twice minimum wage. There are lots of Canadians. There aren't that many at the 20,000 for life, but there are a fair number at the 40,000 for life. What should they do with our system? Uh, basically, they should save 1,600 per year in a TFSA during their working life. And that's it. And if they do that, what they're going to find is during their working life, their take-home pay after taxes, after CPP, after EI, after their 1600 in the TFSA is a little under 30000 a year. The retirement income, when you take the TFSA and the government pensions and the refundable tax credits, will be a little more than 25000 a year. So they'll have 85% net income replacement saving $1,600 a year in a TFSA. During their working lifetime, if they save uniformly, their average TFSA balance would be about $30,000. So, so here's the thing. We, we beat the system up a lot because we grab statistics that are the wrong statistics. You know, what percentage of Canadians are saving for retirement isn't the right statistic. What's the average balance if we take all Canadians of working age and average their RSP and TFSA balances? It's supposed to be small. Now, having said that, it doesn't mean we don't have serious problems. The sad thing in Canada is we do have problems uh, and we keep misdiagnosing them. You can't solve Canada's problem by forcing low-income people to contribute to the CPP or contribute to a PRPP. Uh, they shouldn't be saving. And anything that encourages them to save is a disservice. Uh, if you take people with below average income and you force them through their employers or directly to put money in the CPP and or to put money in an RSP, which is what the PRPP was going to do, uh, then you're, you're basically having their income today go into the wrong savings vehicle. You know, four years ago, we created the TFSA for a number of purposes, one of which was to provide a decent way for low-income people to save for retirement. The problem with them being in the CPP is they will lose at least 50% of every penny of additional benefit they collect to the GIS clawback. Equally, if you put them in RRSPs, they will lose at least 50 cents of every dollar they contribute to GIS clawbacks. You do the math. You do the math. You know, if, I, if I gave anybody in this room, uh, you know, you're all financial advisors, if I said, I got an opportunity for you and your clients. You can put money in this account over here. Every dollar that goes in, I'm giving you back 20 cents. The only catch is at the end of the day, I'm taking 50% of whatever's in the account. You know, now, if there's, if there's a, a single one of you that would voluntarily go into that arrangement or recommend it to a client, you got to go back for more PD. You know, that mathematically, that just doesn't work. And yet that's exactly what's being uh, proposed to foist on low-income Canadians. When I say low-income, I don't mean poor. I mean anyone below average. So the bottom line is, I don't mind the structure of the PRPP, the idea that we need a big national savings plan that helps people, streams them into the right options, gives them good investment choices, 
uh, helps them make better decisions, has better default options, uh, operates efficiently for low fees. I'm all for that. But you lose the entire advantage of it when you start streaming them into the wrong tax shelter. So if we're going to have a PRPP, let's get it properly designed. Similarly, I have no problem with expanding the CPP. But when the expansion affects people who don't need bigger pensions, they need bigger take-home pay today, when it makes their life more difficult, when it streams a bunch of money on their behalf into a vehicle where they're going to lose it coming out the other end, uh, that's, that's a misuse of what a larger Canada pension plan should be. And the, the sad thing is there's such a small percentage of Canadians who understand how the system works uh, that regularly we read in the papers is a wonderful big leap forward, both of these things. And they have the potential to be great leaps forward, but not if we misdesign them. Thank you. Thank you, Malcolm. I'm sure we'll come right back to some of those points because they're pretty intriguing. But first, we're going to give uh, Bill Tufts his uh, five to eight minutes at, at the podium here. And Bill is, of course, the founder and executive director of Fair Pensions for All, which is an organization advocating pension reform in Canada. Now, a good description of his work was included in the Montreal Gazette when they wrote that Tufts is the founder and curator of a national blog titled Fair Pensions for All that is one of North America's leading aggregators of public sector pension news in the developed world. Now, Bill was invited by the Ontario Finance Minister to participate in 2010 in a roundtable on retirement security as an industry expert and stakeholder. The following year, he was invited by the California Foundation for Fiscal Responsibility as a special guest to the boot camp for elected officials in Irvine, California. As a policy advisor on pension matters, Bill has advised members of Parliament, the Canadian Federation of Independent Business, the Canadian Taxpayers Federation, and provincial and municipal elected representatives. In addition, he has written pension policy for the Canadian Chamber of Commerce. And he's also the author of the book, uh, uh, what's it called, Pension Ponzi, which I reviewed among many people in the press. So uh, over to you, Bill. Uh, thank you. It's uh, hard to follow with uh, Susan and Malcolm. Both uh, have some very good ideas and well in touch with what's happening in our, in our world today. We're all familiar with, you know, how long ago was it that we heard David Foote talking about the, the boom, bust, and echo and the various other books, The Pig and the Python, that went through and looked at what was happening to our, our demographics. I think we've, you know, we're there today, but I still don't think that most Canadians really understand what the impact is going to be. Starting last year, there was a thousand Canadians a day that were turning age 65. That was a hopeful date for retirement for most of us. They're going to be turning age 65 at a, the same rate of a thousand a day every year until the year 2029. It's got the, it's, the impact that it's going to have. I don't think we can even begin to understand today. It's going to dramatically change the whole structure of our society, our economy, and those are some of the realities that we're dealing with, with today. It's interesting to look at how we got here to talk about the PRPP. Uh, there was, uh, it, when I was in the roundtable on security forum, I was there with Malcolm. We were in front of the Ontario government, uh, their roundtable on security forum. And, and that, those were a group of uh, roundtables across the country that were looking into the various issues of retirement security for Canadians. A lot of them just turned out to be a, a forum to look at different ways, different accounting means to salvage the public sector pension plans, which of course have been uh, horribly uh, hit since 2008. They've got excellent managers, they've got excellent cash flows, but it's starting to you know, come into doubt even whether or not they will be able to provide what they, they've promised. Imagine uh, somebody working for 30 years, contributing 10% every year into their their defined benefit pension plan, yet when they retire at the other end, the expectation is it takes 70% out of that uh, same amount of income, and they're going to take out 70% for 30 years. So the math just isn't working. It did uh, when we implemented the CPP, when there was life expectancies to age 72, when you know Canadians were you know, expecting that they were going to live a short time into retirement. Those life expectancies of an Banded way out there. Uh, there's certainly problems with the way that uh, you know the pensions have been invested, just because of the poor returns on equities. 
the very low rate on bonds. So that's sort of got us to the point of the PRPP. I think everybody realizes that there is a problem uh, for, for security for most Canadians. Uh, there's some validity with the, you know, the Malcolm's position that lower income Canadians are pretty well looked after. I think that uh, admirably Susan has been advocating for the, the bigger CPP, basically doubling the CPP where it is today. The CPP is uh, targeting 25% of people's working incomes and a doubling in the CPP would bring it up to 50%. Today, the average Canadian is only taking out $6,500 out of their CPP and it was in the last election that the two uh, concepts, the PRPP and the CPP came head to head. I, I think the Liberal and the NDP were in favour of a larger CPP and it was the current government that suggested a PRPP might be a, a better route to go. Of course, the current government was elected and they went ahead and they implemented the, the rules for the PRPP earlier this year. One of the challenges with the PRPP, which uh, I, I think is a, a good vehicle for, for, for most Canadians, is the fact that uh, the regulations are administered at a provincial level. So there was a lot of discussion a few years ago uh, about the national regulator. That would have been made the implementation of the PRPP a lot simpler. The PP, PRPP identified there was a gap and that mandatory re contributions were required for, for Canadians. Uh, how many Canadians are not contributing anything into their, their RRSP or other vehicle savings like the TFSA? Whether or not they were saving enough, the average Canadian today hits age 65. They've only got $60,000 in their RRSP, so there's a, a gap there. One of the other concerns coming out of the uh, discussions leading up to the PRPP was the amount of money that Canadians were going to be left with, despite saving for their lifetime, the, the, the cost of management fees. So those were all things that started to, to factor into it and, and built the discussion around the PRPP. The discussions of the PRPP looked at uh, what was happening in New, New Zealand where they implemented a program called the Kiwi Saver Program. Some of the things that we see in the PRPP has uh, been drawn out of that. It's going to be a mandatory plan for employees. At this point in time, there's no mandatory employer contribution and there, there's the opt-out feature where they implemented the opt-out feature in the Kiwi Savings Plan. People's inertia generally meant that, uh, you know, 95% percent of people never opted out. Uh, then there was the, the concept of the pooling of the pensions in order to reduce the cost so that Canadians would have more money at retirement. That's a you know, particularly tricky issue for our industry here because the average mutual fund you know, generating 2.1 percent in MERs, that goes to pay us in this room here, it goes to pay the insurance companies and the banks and the specialty investment layers in between. The other option is the pension funds, the OMERS and the teachers of the world, which, you know, are it costs them about 35 to 45 basis points to manage those funds. So that's where we are in terms of the PRPP coming together. It doesn't look like there's any movement for the PRPP across the country. Most of the provinces have been more concerned about salvaging the uh, public sector pension plans that, that have been dis devastated. They're getting devastated dis despite the huge amounts of money that roll into them every year. The public sector pension plans in, in Canada for that 20% of the, the workforce that's in the public sector, they're con collecting $30 billion a year. The other 80% that are counting on RRSPs and pensions, RRSPs are only collecting $35 billion a year. So you can see there's a, a big gap there that, that needs to be bridged. Uh, I think that the PRPP with the mandatory contributions will start to do that. And it's a matter of whether or not that gets rolled out. If the province, some action in the provinces, actually the PRPP was built around a system that had been placed in Saskatchewan for the last decade or so that was a very good uh, program, very low MERs and uh, you were able to contribute money into it that accumulated at a, a rate similar to pension fund returns. The Quebec system got off the, the get on, got out of the gate quickly when the PRPP was announced. They've already put together some regulations regarding what they're calling the voluntary retirement savings plans. However, I'm co some, somewhat concerned that across the country, no other provinces have made the move towards the PRPP. The, the political scenario is, at the end of the day is going to dictate what happens out there. Uh, should we follow a big CPP, which is a complete socialization? of the retirement system. 
that would uh, take another $30 billion uh, perhaps out of the you know, pockets of Canadians that they're putting into investing in the CPP. Uh, there's middle of the road that maybe our in retirement income system today is going to, to be able to main, maintain our retirement security and going forward for the next 20, 30 years. Is it going to be able to stand up to that demographic tsunami? We've already seen that last year was the first year of the baby boomers turning age 65. Pensions are in crisis. The OAS has already been raised to, to age 67. And so if we don't get off uh, you know, our, our, our butts and do something about the PRPP, I think in the, we're going to see the political reality might be back to the CPP program. And uh, you know, Susan Ng has every right at that point in time to advocate for additional security for Canadians. And so I think that it takes the, there's an interest of people in the room here to get out and get involved. Make your voice be, be known about what your, your thoughts are on the PRPP and make sure that our politicians are moving towards that vein. Of course, there's a discussion, what's the difference between the PRPP and the RRSP? But I think at the end of the day, we're gonna see some sort of a mandatory savings program and it might be a big CPP or it might be a PRPP, and I think for our industry, we'd be much better positioned for the large PRPP. So it's uh, good to see that uh, we're having this discussion today and some of the key concepts around it, and uh, I'm sure that uh, the rest of the people at the table have some very good ideas about that. So thanks for having me up. <coughs> Thank you, Bill. Uh, it seems like the two big innovations we're talking about here in the last five years are obviously the PRPP has come up in every one of the panelists' discussions here and the uh, TFSA, or Tax-Free Savings Account. If I understand, Malcolm, what you were, you were saying is that the, the TFS, if the PRPP were based on the TFSA rather than the RSP or RPP structure, that would deliver what you think they're doing. But the question is, is that what you're saying? And two, why doesn't the government do it that way? Okay, that is what I'm saying, and I obviously don't know why they don't do it that way, but, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I, I can point out the obvious conflict the government has. The uh, Department of Finance has always hated the TFSA. The TFSA was not a creation of the Department of Finance. It was part of the platform of uh, the Conservative Party. And uh, when they got elected, uh, they put in the TFSA against the better judgment of finance, the, their concern they have, and it's, it's written up quite clearly in the triennial report for the old age security program, is uh, when that TFSA went in, the default tax shelter for Canadians with below average incomes should have switched from RSP to TFSA the next day. It didn't. Most of the corporate plans still stream people into group RSPs and registered pension plans against their better interest. It takes Canadians a long time after something happens to get their head around what it really means, and nobody's working very hard to make sure they understand that. So, so the OAS report is now filled with speculation about whether over time uh, Canadians with below average incomes will migrate to TFSAs, because if they do, they will end up collecting the full guaranteed income supplement, or whatever part of it they get given their CPP, because CPP is also clawed back out of the guaranteed income supplement. If, on the other hand, they use RRSPs, then the guaranteed income supplement in future will be effectively no more expensive than it is today as a proportion of OAS. So, so the bottom line, what I think is happening is I think finance has told the government uh, that part of making old age security and guaranteed income supplement sustainable Part of keeping the cost reasonable is one, to push retirement ages up, initially from 65 to 67, and two, put in something like the PRPP, or frankly, a big CPP, that forces low-income people to save in vehicles that will disqualify them later on from the guaranteed income supplement. If, if the federal government just came out and said that, I would have no objection, none, none at all. Like, if it's a matter of public policy, they say we made a terrible mistake with this guaranteed income supplement, and the only way to fix it is to compel low-income people to save money against their own financial interests, and we think as a matter of public policy we should do that, then I'd stand back and say, well, at least it's an honest description of what's going on here. Uh, 
and so what, what I think they're doing is they're just sort of grabbing for the money and uh, hoping it works out well. And it may be the right thing to do, but it's the wrong way to do it because it's, in, it's just unavoidable that 10 years from now, when some of these people have been auto-enrolled in the wrong tax shelter, and they have, through scrimping and saving and sacrificing, built up some small nest egg that they're pretty proud of, you know, and then we're not talking multi-million dollar nest eggs here. We're talking 20, 30,000 hard come by dollars sitting in a tax shelter. And when the penny drops, that they're paying 50 to 70 percent of that to the federal government when it comes out, and they only got a 20 percent credit when it went in, my guess is they're going to figure out that this whole thing was a bit of a scam, and we don't need to go there. We shouldn't go there. So I, I don't know why they're doing it. That's, uh, that's what I fear. Susan, you seem to have some uh, yeah, opinions here. I, I think that whatever the government was going to do, they should have asked us first. And, uh, and I, I worry about uh, distorting the discussion by focusing on the low income, who, by the way, are no one's interest when we talk about government policy setting, when it really comes right down to it. And I would agree with Malcolm to say that um, for low income individuals, who, by the way, don't we hope, stay long income all of their lives. We like to think that in, a, in our uh, society and economy that some people stay at low income early on in their careers and move on. I think we've all, you know, sort of bus dishes and so on, but, <clears throat> and so, uh, so we have to look at a life cycle. We have to look at lifetime limits, uh, make up your opportunity to save when later on you make a lot more money than you did earlier. I agree that when people do not have a lot of income coming in, they should not be forced to make contributions. Some, however, in their junior years uh, were very resistant to making contributions to find uh, benefit plans, but ask some of them now in the 40s and 50s, and aren't they glad? So I don't think that these rules necessarily necessarily are universal. The main thing for the low income groups is that while they are an important group for us as a society, they are not an interesting group neither for politicians nor for the industry since they're not going to have a lot of money to become your customers with. So the, the public policy recommendations that we make for the very low income and those who have career low income is to provide better income supports. We're not suggesting that we provide massive programs to have them, you know, save from whatever they have left to, for their own retirement. Uh, we'd like to think that we'll have some way of getting them out of that category through the time of their career, but if they don't manage to do so, that our income supports are adequate at the other end of their career. And that's why it's so damaging and so upsetting to our members, who are, by the way, not low income, that the OAS has been shifted those two years, as Malcolm has indicated, because people see it as an important part of a social safety net. That said, separate and apart from that, the people that we're worried about not saving enough money are the people above $40,000. The, the people who are working in average careers with average needs, mortgages, children going to university, and so on, those are the people who, when they don't have workplace pensions, are not saving well for their retirement, and they're your clients, and maybe a universal plan like a PRPP or enhancement to the CPP might actually take food out of your children's mouths because they're joining a larger plan. But the reality is, is that if people are going to become, are going to save adequately and feel, feel uh, comfortable in their retirement and as they're facing retirement, they're going to have more money to invest other than in these larger plans and have a port balanced portfolio. For them, we need to have vehicles that will make more sense for them to help them save. Working on the inertia that Bill mentioned, you know, why the PRPP has automatic enrollment once an employer chooses is that there is research that indicates that people don't take steps to change their financial circumstances. So if you auto-enroll them, they won't take the steps to get off. And so the net reaction, the net result there is people will have saved rather than have spent. And that's a net new gain in terms of people saving for their retirement. The job of the industry and public policy is to make sure that those savings amount to something. And that's, th that's the nexus that we're looking at now. And the, the, the piece that allows people to grow their savings and magnify the amount that they have there is the contribution by employers. 
that will both incent them to actually save and also lever the savings that they put in place. And so in that way, we would be supportive of that change to the PRPPs. Cool. Malcolm. What Susan's describing is what the PRPP should be. Uh, unfortunately, it's not what it is. Yes. Uh, you know, well, if, I'm if, an advocate. Yeah, but if, if, I mean, if we, if we want to say the problem with inadequate savings is people over 40 or 50,000, we should roll out a plan for people who make more than 40 to 50,000. It's easy to do. Just roll out the P PRPP and say the default contribution on the first 40,000 of earnings is zero. And the contribution rate's 18% of earnings in excess of 40,000. And then, then you have a design where all of the, you know, for all of the people who default into options, you have a design that takes money only from people with relatively good incomes and puts it into a uh, cost-efficient savings vehicle. So the, the puzzle of the PRPP is uh, that the, when you listen to the federal government describe it as to who the target audience is, it isn't people with above average earnings. Now, they're very clear. It's people with modest earnings is who they're targeting. When you look at the only province that actually introduced legislation to implement the PRPP, which was Quebec. Uh, the legislation, I think, was basically disappeared when, the, uh, when they had the election, but they introduced legislation for what they called the VRSP, the Voluntary Retirement Savings Plan, which was their version of the PRPP. The default contribution rate was going to be 4% of all earnings. Now, 4% isn't remotely enough for people with substantially above average incomes. And it's wildly too high for low-income people. So we, you know, and, and then you, you look at the whole purpose of this, the, the underpinnings of the PRPP design, the innovation that is constantly referred to is the use of behavioral finance. And the great insight of behavioral finance, and this will be well known to most of you, is that the average person has no interest at all in financial planning. And lucky for you, lucky for me, lucky for all the financially literate people, but the, the average person isn't terribly interested in it. There's a reason why the sports page is widely read, you know, and personal finance columns are not. And, and so the, the whole thinking, the whole innovation here was the important thing is if people are just going to stumble into whatever the defaults are, you know, the, the behavioral finance experiments are things like if you default people into the plan, they're too lazy to opt out. Whereas if you start them out of the plan and say you can opt in, they're too lazy to opt in. And so the participation rate is critically dependent on what the default option is. Same for investments, same for other, every other choice they make. So here's the irony. We're rolling this thing out. We're saying we're going to target it at people with modest incomes. We put the defaults as the wrong contribution rate for everybody and the wrong tax shelter for people with modest incomes. And when you, when you confront the federal government with that, we say, well, all the people have to do is opt out. Well, the whole purpose of the design was to take advantage of the fact that people are too lazy to opt out. So, so the bottom line is the structure, the idea, everything is fine. The defaults suck. They're all wrong. And, and, and we're not going to end up, you know, the, the, the notion that it's probably going to be fine for your clients, probably going to be fine for people like me, going to be fine for, for wealthy people and people above average incomes. I mean, it's a sensible thing for all of them. Uh, but if at the end of the day we end up having exploited, knowingly, the very significant portion of the population with below average earnings, uh, my guess is it's not going to be good for anybody. And that we should just think this through more clearly than we have to date. The... Um the question of the expanded CPP or enhanced CPP, uh, whether it should be doubled or not, I know, Susan, you had some thoughts on that. Uh, but first I wanted to ask the question, why, why can't they just, uh, I think Fred Vatis, uh, Mar Marno Chappelle has suggested this, why can't you just double the CPP by applying it to like twice the, the wage instead of one? So you, all, all of a sudden you're paying whatever it is, 9.9% on an on $80,000 salary instead of a $48,000 salary, I guess a $94,000 salary. Doesn't, isn't that a simple way to go? Well, I, I think that uh, the enhancing the CPP has two ways to go. Either you double the amount of uh, contribution and coverage on the, the lower half, the 
part under YMP, or you can extend the coverage above that average uh, industrial wage to, say, 80,000, and then more people would be covered by the, the amount. Um, in both cases, if you expand the CPP in either direction, the piece that gets expanded is the contribution, which is mandatory currently under the legislation, and that's what's having some people bulk, especially at the low end, because oftentimes the people working in low income are working in smaller businesses who can't afford the additional uh, payment, the mandatory contribution. So uh, the answer is yes, you could do both. Um, the, this, the way you described it, increasing the coverage level would certainly cover more of the middle income groups, and I think that a lot of people would welcome that. Um, the, other, the third way of doing it is to make a voluntary layer of the CPP that people can buy into and take advantage of the investment power of the CPPIB. Um, the danger here is that we, we should also know how much that mandatory contribution is, because a knee-jerk reaction by many of the small business uh, associations has been to say, we will go out of business, we will lose jobs, but if you actually do the calculation, it's a very small amount per month to buy into a pension plan that has some promise to it. But I think there has to be a mix in people's portfolios, both a large plan as well as individual uh, investments. Bill, do you have any thoughts on this? Uh, yeah, I, you know, there's obviously that we have to do something. I'm wondering just how much more we can afford. Uh, I think the projections going ahead on the CPP already show that the unfunded shortfalls uh, 15 to 20 years out on that plan is about $2 trillion. Uh, we've, you know, got a whole bunch of things that haven't been calculated into our, our economic scenario going forward and just in terms of this whole demographic tsunami and for, are we going to look like Japan where, you know, over the next 20 years we're going to see a 75 percent, you know, decrease in the value of uh, people's assets. Just what is that uh, demographic tsunami really going to look like? We haven't even started to speak about health care or, or long-term care and how that's going to factor into it. I'm very alarmed about uh, raising any more contributions out of the private sector where the economy's been buffeted very heavily in the last uh, 10 years. We've lost 300,000 manufacturing jobs. Thank goodness they've been picked up by government. It works out level on the GDP, but uh, it's not really a jet, jet income uh, producing an inner, you know, generating jobs. So I think we need to be very careful where we go. One of the things that uh, we did find out was when they looked at the OAS and they were going to move it up to age 67, there was a complimentary report there that uh, the government refused to uh, release that showed what the, those statistics look like. I think they're starting to see that the OAS, uh, you know, moved to 67 is just part of, part of what needs to be done. Uh, one other way that uh, we were recommending that the Canadians could pay for their, their retirement is to uh, take uh, the $30 billion a year that we're paying into the public sector pensions and perhaps equalize that a little better. The, uh, there's a lot of money that's uh, drained out there to allow a, a huge uh, gap between the haves and the have-nots. A, a typical public sector employee who's going to end up with a million dollar retirement plan, a police officer who retires at age 53 on average with you know $60,000 a year that he's going to collect twice as much on his uh, income or in his pension as he w does over the full course of his work, working, you know, career. And those are things that I think need to be addressed in terms of fairness. Uh, there's a lot of unfairness in the system right now between the public sector, private sector. There's the unfairness between generations. Uh, imagine being somebody in Omers today, you're paying 15% of your, your income into a pe defined benefit pension plan. The shortfall is increasing. It's increased from $278 million a few years ago has been growing exponentially to over $10 billion today. You're pumping money into the plan uh, in one of these DV plans and you're wondering if the money's going to be there when you're getting there and two-thirds of your contributions going in to pay shortfalls. So there's a whole bunch of uh, issues that need to be taken into place. I'm very reluctant to move ahead with the, the CPP and the additional burden that will put on the economy. Yes, something needs to be done for Canadians and I'm in favor of the, uh, the PRPP. There's uh, obviously some, some things that can be wrinkled out and uh, ironed out of the PRPP. It doesn't look like we're going to get to it for one heck of a long time here in Ontario. The finance minister who is actively involved with uh, the discussions around it uh, has resigned. We're probably going to have another election in six months' time. There's going to be a lot of business on the table between now and then. The lost opportunity is, you know, those Canadians that uh, haven't properly put anything into their retirement plans between now and then. And uh, I think there is the risk that if uh, we don't uh, see action from 
you know, provincial governments that the, the CPP might be the last, last option on, on the table. So, uh, you know, lo lots of considerations and I'm very alarmed that, uh, you know, we're, right now we're in a, a, a financial crisis here in Ontario that most people aren't aware of. There was a recent report out of the states that looked at the uh, budget financing in the states in the United States. The worst state is New York State. It has a debt of $13,000 per capita. Ontario's per capita debt is 17000 So I think, you know, we need to look at how we're going to get uh, our economic engine back on track before we put any more additional uh, weight on the backs of businesses. And I think eventually if we went ahead with the PRPP, it's uh, strictly in, in mandatory for employees right now, but I, we're also coming up against some very severe uh, labor shortages that, uh, you know, the demographics show that uh, we're going to be into in Canada in just a few years, and I think you'll see that the employers will step on board with some sort of a mandatory contribution. And, of course, those uh, once the plan gets up and running and we evaluate the amount of money that's flowing into them, they can be adjusted on an annual basis so that the contribution levels do go up if required. And, uh, you know, there's, I think we should be urging our governments to go ahead with the PRPP. The, um, the PRPP, the nature of how they're invested, it, it, those of you who listened to Michael Lee Chin's a very interesting presentation, where he, in effect, criticized mutual funds on five different fronts, everything from fees to diversification to the fact they were all publicly traded equities. Uh, I noticed in our pre-notes, uh, uh, I'm not sure if it was Susan, somebody had talked about uh, in, in other countries, in Australia, some of the direct investments are held in super low fee uh, Vanguard ETFs, um, so I'm curious as to whether, I even if the PRP does become a big you know, asset gathering phenomenon for advisors, whether we're going to end up in the same kind of ineffective mutual funds that Michael Lee Chin just criticized. So anybody either on the panel or actually out there in the audience like to respond to that? Well, I, 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 didn't, I didn't hear his criticism, so I won't uh, address it directly. The, I don't know that there's a DC plan anywhere. Uh, that holds illiquid investments. Uh, one of the, the problems you have with the DC structure is people have to be able to buy in at market value monthly and they have to be able to cash out monthly and typically uh, they're allowed to move money from fund to fund on occasion and redirect where their future monies go. So people are given uh, a fair bit of flexibility. Um, you know, the, 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 the problem you get is this private equity and infrastructure and real estate, they all may be very well and good, and uh, some of our Ontario public sector plants have, uh, are very skillful at uh, taking advantage of that, but none of them have members who can cash out or buy in at will. Like, n nobody knew at the end of 2008 what any of those investments were really worth. And so uh, if we're going to use a PRPP, defined contribution savings type structure and we're going to use illiquid investments which on occasion no one knows what they're worth uh, we're going to have to figure out how to deal with that and I'm to best of my knowledge nobody's figured out how to do that yet I mean one way to do it would be to tell members some of your money's in something where you can't get it out uh, on demand you might have to wait years or there'll be complicated rules uh, but that runs very much against the grain for PRPP, which is all default and not many explanations. So, uh, so I, 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 I just don't know whether that's a, that's a viable way to proceed. I would, to go back to the first rule of behavioral finance, our members, and I, as uh, Welcome has said, most Canadians, uh, have no interest in how their money grows. They would just like to park their money someplace safe and have it grow for them. <laughs> and so they like something that sounds good like the CPP because so many other people are sharing the risk or a defined benefit plan where they know what they're going to get at the end of the year. And those kinds of options are, are basically blocked for Canadians at this point. So we're trying to patch up something else that might actually look like it. And we're not going to be able to if we continually say that those people who have defined benefits are our enemies, that somehow that they did something and they're taking our money to do it. Let's, let's break it down a little bit and be careful about what we're talking about. Omers and teachers, they too have uh, people who work for 15 years, 20 years, some, some of them, and they're still 
collecting their pension, some into their 80s. They will have collected pensions longer than they ever contributed as working members of the plan. So is that the model? Is that something wrong with that model? Should we change that model? Should we have that model for ourselves? Um, it used to be that civil service salaries were much lower than market. That's not true anymore. At that time, it was important to keep people in the workforce and stay working with the civil service. Should we change that model because it was based on changed assumptions? And finally, when we're talking about people who are out here in the general public as to what we can afford to put away, what is the right amount to put away for our own, uh, our own retirement and what vehicle can we put it into and what can the industry as a whole promise in terms of returns? Is it an issue of fees? Is it the type of advice? Is it the asset mix? That's all beyond my pay grade. Um, all I can say is our members are looking at their portfolios that, uh, portfolios that were devastated in the last crash. They're looking at their children who they see as not saving enough and no measure of doing so. They see friends and themselves losing their jobs and not getting new ones. And employers who have not come to grip with what the statisticians tell us is that there's going to be a looming labor shortage. Just a brief comment there. They're, they're, they tell us there's going to be a la looming labor shortage, which, which suggests that employers should actually be keeping their older workers rather than firing them, thinking that they'll do better with younger workers. In fact, that's not true. They don't get a competitive advantage from people who all graduated from the same MBA class. So it's, it's that kind of broader thinking that we have to start grappling with. It's not an easy choice between CPP or the PRPPs or uh, you know, any of the other funds that are out there. As according to my calculations, we're two minutes from lunch, and I would like, hate to be the person to stop that from happening and getting us back on schedule. If there's anybody who wants to, on the panel who wants to desperately say something, or anybody out there who is able to grab a microphone, now's your chance. Speak now or forever hold your peace. Sounds like everybody's uh, hunger for food is greater than their hunger for knowledge. Oh, wait. One way over we have there. one coming. I'll hide behind the uh, podium a little bit. Um, one thing that struck me as our, our panel was discussing the various types of plans and strategies that could be used is that all of these plans have accumulated over the years uh, and many times in consequence for mistakes that have been made precedent to them. So per Malcolm's uh, discussion in particular, I was quite disappointed to hear you say that we should not be encouraging Canadians to save. Uh, by any means. That strikes me as just wrong uh, as a professional and immoral in principle. I would like my clients to be independent of others. I want them to establish financial independence so that, by God, they'll never get the GIS. That they'll have their own savings plans that don't depend on government, don't depend on taxpayer subsidized plans. I haven't heard anyone on the panel, and I, I'm curious to know if anyone is aware of advocacy that encourages some of the dismantling of these things and specifically advocates for the independence of individual Canadians of all of these various programs. I think the TFSA is the best thing that ever happened to our clients because it specifically allows people not to pay tax on their future income and their limit increases over the years so it will gradually wean Canadians from all kinds of taxpayer subsidized programs. And I would appreciate a brief comment on each of your view of the TFSA as what I would consider a stroke of genius. I would have to agree with that. Um, since its inception, some 8.2 million Canadians have taken it up with, with no advertising you know, with no effort whatsoever. It's simple and uh, it's limited in, in scope in terms of dollars involved, but without any effort whatsoever and the government doesn't lose any tax revenues as you put your money in. And since you're not making, some are not making very much money in this climate inside the TFSA, they're not losing any deferred taxes either. So it is a stroke of genius. The only way to improve it is to uh, increase the limit to a lifetime limit so that people can replace the, the money they've lost. 
And of course, they have said that once the, bu the budget is balanced, that they're going to go to $10,000. I might say that we're preparing right now, in uh, money sense, a, a feature on how to make your child a millionaire. If you start putting into 5000 every year mm. and invest aggressively, i.e. not in, in just interest-bearing investments, easily get your kid in 50 years past a million dollars. I guess my question is, will the government renege when we have the second Prime Minister Trudeau? <laughs> well, I mean, I wouldn't, wouldn't discount that. <laughs> I mean, the, no, the, you know, the problem is, we, I very much like the TFSA, and I like people being financially independent, and I like them being self-supporting. Uh, Fifty years ago, Canada went down a different road. Uh, we went down a road that said that uh, all Canadians, regardless of whether they could